All right, Nina. Nina, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Well, I was born in Ashgabat, Turkmenistan, the former Soviet Union. Uh, when I was seven, I came to the States and I grew up mostly in Northern California, uh, a little town called Fairfield. It's about 50 miles north of here. What was your family like? Um, well, in Turkmenistan, I had a large family. Um, I never knew my biological father. Um, my mother and I lived with my great grandmother. Um, it was pretty much all women. Women raised me. Uh, my aunt, my grandma. Um, big family. Uh, everybody lived really close to each other. Um, my great grandmother was kind of the, the matriarch of the family. Um, here, nobody knows who she is, but um, back in Turkmenistan, she's a, a, a famous actress in theater. Um, she worked in government. Uh, and so when my mom was growing up, um, she had a lot of money, uh, and the Soviet Union obviously fell apart. So right when I was born, uh, we kind of lost everything. Um, and, uh, it was pretty difficult, but I mean, I never really, I never realized it when I was a kid, um, until I looked back on it as I was surrounded by so many so many family members, you know, you, we never wanted for food or, or anything like that. Um, and uh, when we moved to the United States, uh, it was just my mother, my stepfather, and myself. Um, I actually have a half sister, different father, um, who my mother uh, chose to leave behind um, with her father. Uh, so, um, it was lonely growing up. Uh, my parents worked all the time, um, so I was by myself a lot. Uh, and we couldn't go back to visit until we came in like 1994. We didn't go back to visit until 2005. Uh, we, were, we were technically um, illegal. Uh, my mom didn't want to um, get her citizenship here in Turkmenistan. It's a very... Um, like, it's like one of the most authoritarian countries in the world. Um, definitely can't have dual citizenship. Uh, and so she was waiting until the political situation might change. Um, she didn't want to give up her Turkmen citizenship, but things just got worse and worse um, politically. I mean, the country got wealthier and everything's, you know, uh, there's paved roads where there were dirt roads before. I mean, when we went back, it was jarring uh, how much, you know, things had advanced. Um, but as far as, you know, uh, like civil liberties and, and stuff like that, it just got worse and worse. So, um, you know, uh, yeah. Was, are, you, are you grateful that you came to the U.S.? Um, that's a tough question. Uh, I was told to be grateful my whole life. Um, you know, anytime I was upset or complained about something, uh, you know, it was, that was always, you know, you, sh you should be grateful. I'm grateful we came here. Um, but, I mean, I didn't have a choice, you know, in the matter. I was six, seven years old. And I, I didn't really understand fully that we were leaving and not coming back. Um, that was kind of my mom's, you know, I wouldn't say dream, but uh, that was her, her primary goal was to, escape that place um and in like or later years um once I was you know in my mid-20s or so uh you know she'd share with me that she just she wanted to get away from her family and uh not just get away from the place but get away from family and stuff like that and and you know I never I never wanted that I didn't choose that um I often think how my life would have been different. I mean, I, I was able to come here and have an education and, and all this stuff, you know, that I wouldn't have had there. Um, I probably would have been married with children, you know, by the time I was like 16 or 18 or so. Um, but uh, I don't know. Now, now that I look back on my life, I don't know if that would have been so bad compared to, you know, what's happening now. But... Um, then I think I could have ended up an addict 
there as well. It's like one in four people are, are heroin addicts there. Is my right? uncle, my uncle, uh, yeah, was a really bad heroin addict. He died in, in jail. Uh, it was, yeah, just my whole life, you know, as far as I can remember, uh, he was, he was using and, uh, it's crazy. This project, when I first started it, I just thought, oh my God, look at all these crazy drug addicts in, in Los Angeles where I'm based. Yeah. And then I came up here and I went to other cities and I realized it's just just as bad in other cities. And then I hear these stories from other countries and I've, I've traveled a bit. It's bad everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And there, um, you know, they don't have like harm reduction like we have in San Francisco. So like HIV is rampant and, you know, it's so... I don't know how things would have turned out. Um, you know, I I wish I could have grown up with with my family. Um, and it's ironic. I mean, not everything got better um, once we came here. You know, people say, "Oh, you go to America and you can you know live out your dreams and this and that." Well, um, you know, I, we had, we we had this piano um, in our apartment. Like, as long as, you know, I can remember, I my mean, great-grandma got it when she was, you know, like, in her mid-30s or 40s or something. Uh, and she was, like, in her 80s when, when I was young. Um, so it was, it was in the family forever. And I had piano lessons when I was a kid. When we came to the United States, we couldn't afford them anymore, you know? So little things like that, um, you know, I just... I don't know. It's it's lonely here, you know. Uh, it's that's that sense of family is just not not quite there, you know. It's, uh, were there any particularly rough spots in your childhood? Um, yeah. Um, my stepdad was um like physically abusive towards me from time I was seven, probably like 17. Uh, I think 17 was the first time I hit him back. <laughs> um, and left the house for a week. I went to my best friend's house and my mom called me crying, asked me to come back. Um, you know, he had a really bad temper. Uh, um, and I, you know, I try to be understanding now looking back on it. I think, you know, he was 23 and, and fresh out of college, got sent to this, you know, place that had just become a country, literally. Uh, so he was a political science Spanish uh, major in, in college and worked in Mexico and Argentina. So I think he thought he was going to go to a Spanish speaking country and they sent him to this, like, you know, butt fuck Turkmenistan. He's like, what the hell? Where is this place even? He went from what country to? Uh, well, he came from the United States to Turkmenistan for the Peace Corps. I think he thought that they would send him oh, to South America because of his, you know, like Spanish fluency or mm -hmm. his past, um, like past work experiences. Worked in an orphanage in Mexico and did something in Argentina. I don't know. You know. Um, so I think that was a shock for him. Uh, they show pictures of him. You know how much weight he lost, and I, uh, you know, his mom. Uh, uh, my grandma would send like peanut butter and like all this stuff in packages, you know, that like we just didn't have out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's crazy to look at the pictures of him because he really did. I mean, he was like almost emaciated uh, compared to you know what he normally looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I try to put myself in his shoes, and and you know, he didn't know what to do. I mean, he had a wife and. A, six, seven-year-old child now. I didn't speak any English when I came to the United States. I knew, like, my mom always told me I knew three words. Please, uh, thank you, and ice cream, I think. Th those were the three words that I knew. And uh, she stressed over it so hard. She's like, how are you going to go to school? What are you going to do? Um, but, you know, I had a tutor and picked it up quickly. It's easy when you're, when you're young. Uh, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as difficult on me, I think, as it was on her. She she had to, she had two degrees um, from the University of Moscow, but they didn't count because it was from the Soviet Union. So she had to start out bagging groceries here. You know, and I think back to that, and I'm like that, that had to be more difficult than, you know, 
anything I would have gone through as a child. Um, how, how far did you go in school? Uh, one year into my master's program. So I have a year left. And what happened? You got derailed. Yeah, I started shooting Oxycontin. Uh, and I, it's not conducive to keeping up with rent and, you know, the demands of a graduate program. Uh, undergrad was, was easy. I did it with my hands tied behind my back, you know, but um, I don't think I was really prepared for how demanding the graduate program would be. Uh, there's just no way, there's just no way I could do it, you know, using, being high. So. I don't think anybody could, really. <laughs> what happened? You dropped out? Yeah, I dropped out, and I tried to go back a couple times, but it just didn't work out. Um, I got clean for 11 months. That's the longest I've been clean since I started using. And that was when I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, uh, my best friend from elementary school, um, here in California, Travis Air Force Base. Uh, she lived there and, and we reconnected and um, we kind of were, not so much for her with the, the uh, drug use, but just in other aspects, we kind of experienced um, some of the same, uh, I guess, tragedies or, uh, you know, um, we just both went through a lot of the same shit somehow. It's just a kind of coincidence or I don't know. Uh, and she she urged me to go there and you know, she said, it's, it's no problem, just come and, uh, you know, you can stay with me until you get your own place and it's easy to find work and it's cheap and all those things were true. And uh, I was probably the most functional I've ever been. Uh, in my adult life, probably my life period. Um, I had two jobs at any point, I had three, three jobs at one point. Uh, you know, my rent was like 400 bucks. Um, so it was easy, um, you know, but eventually I got bored. And, uh, I was working as a bartender, so I started drinking a lot. Um, I just substituted one with the other, you know, and, uh, Yeah, eventually just relapsed. Um, the, a friend of mine that I, I met right when I got there, um, he was playing music on the street and we were downtown, uh, like bar hopping, I guess. Um, and a really beautiful voice, a great guitar player. His name's Justin. Um, we became fast friends and uh, we played music together. Um, but he was also, uh, I guess, a recovering addict. And eventually we, you know, relapsed together. Um, that was that was rough. It was disheartening. It's, I almost like can't like you can't figure out how I got to that place, you know, and I've tried to get clean a couple of times since then and it's like I don't know. I don't think it's not a, it's not a geographical issue you know but at the same time just, San Francisco just seems like it's just like this hellhole that just like sucks you in you know and, uh, I, I don't think I'll ever get clean if, if I don't get away from here probably not where are you staying now uh here there everywhere sometimes I'll get a hotel room uh, sometimes I'll stay with a friend. Sometimes I'll just stay up all night outside. Um, it varies. Being on the street, especially in a neighborhood like the Tenderloin, as a female, tell me how, how difficult that is. Um, no, I mean, I've kind of, I don't know. It's, I've, I've been out here since 2013. Uh, so I've kind of, I guess I've just gotten used to it. Um. Everybody pretty much knows each other, you know? So I feel like there's some security in that, at least, you know? Um, 
there's at least like a small degree of accountability, you know. Um, but and for the, well, for the first eight years or so, I was in two different relationships or four years and then four years after that. Um, so I, in the last couple of years, um, I've actually been on my own single, you know. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I don't really let anybody give me any shit, you know. Uh, and I've been out here long enough that, you know, most people don't, don't fuck with me, but there's, there's still that like fear of, you know, like a stranger or, you know, somebody, you know, coming up on you in the middle of the night. Uh, I'm kind of a, a loner, you know, I prefer to usually be by myself. Uh, I'd rather get high by myself than with other people. Um, that's dangerous, you know. I'm lucky I've, I've never, um, you know, never been like, well, I've never been raped. I came close one time, uh, like when I first came out here. I was so exhausted. I went and slept in my friend's tent, and uh, I woke up to this guy who was, you know, like on top of me. Uh, and he didn't quite, you know, uh, like there was no penetration, but he was he was about to, and I woke up right then. Uh, and, that, and that was awful. Um, but I mean, it's nothing compared to what a lot of the girls out here have been through. Uh, and how do you support yourself? How do you make money? Oh, uh, I, uh, I steal things from stores. Uh, we call it boosting. Um, I don't know. Uh, a lot of the girls out here just you know, prefer like, sex work, but I just can't. I don't know. I, I just don't have like the. I I wish I could, you know, because I feel like I'd make a lot of money. It'd be a lot easier, and uh, uh, I wouldn't have gone to jail as much. Um, but I don't know. It's just I can't just like turn off that switch. And, uh, Uh, the action is just it's something you know intimate. I can't, I can't picture doing it. Uh, just with any old body, you know. Especially for money, just I don't know. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, I've been to jail like a million times, which is horrible. Uh, it's like. Uh, an epidemic in San Francisco now, I guess. Um, everybody's stealing. Um, so just, uh, companies are leaving, you know, closing down. Nobody really wants to like have their business or open their business in San Francisco. You know, Nordstrom's left, and Macy's is closing down. And all these places because um, people just don't give a shit. They're just walking in and grabbing whatever the hell they want, and walking out, and you know. Like, it's like a certain spot everybody knows you just go down and, and, and sell your shit to the fences and I mean it's all just like an open air market uh, a fence know. is a person who buys stolen property from you and they resell it on the street mm -hmm. well they resell it I don't think they resell it on the street well, usually probably they probably have their own buyers or they'll put it online or you know uh Um, whatever, you know, maximizes their profit, I'm sure is, uh, you know, we used to get paid a lot more uh, before COVID and then after COVID, I don't know. Um, it seems like everybody started boosting because, uh, I think because of the looting after George Floyd, um, you know, when, when uh, the looting happened around the country, um, it, San Francisco kind of experienced a taste of that and I think people realized, um, oh, this is actually really easy and it's not as scary as I thought it was. And so you know, all these people are, are going into stores and stealing things that never used to do it before. Um, so it's kind of like what almost everybody does at this point, um, you know. Um, and they just, it's infuriating you know the amount that they pay you is just like paltry 
uh, I don't know, just like a pittance, uh, especially compared to, I'm sure, what they end up making off of it. You know? um, my ex-boyfriend and I did a, like a lot of high-end stuff uh, right before COVID. Um, Burberry was the, the big one for us, and that was great because we'd make like $700 off of a jacket. You know, we, we had a fence that paid us like 35%, but um, COVID happened and, and everything shut down. Remember, uh, it was right before my birthday. It was a couple of days before my birthday and, and everything was closed and we had no idea what to do. Uh, and we had to, I guess, like l learn how to start, you know, stealing other things. Um, like medicine and I don't know it's it's there's a there's like a there's a market for everything you can pretty much sell anything out there you know uh, it sounds like a terrible lifestyle though where you're just surviving off it's exhausting it's exhausting um I mean there's, there's a lot of anxiety you know uh I mean, you don't you don't want to get caught. You don't want to go to jail. Um, it's embarrassing, you know. When you get caught in a store and other normal people looking at you, you know. Uh, at least for me, it is. I don't know if, if everybody gets embarrassed, but I do. You know, I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, like, "Fuck, what if like one of my college professors is in this fucking Walgreens right now?" You know, <laughs> like. What, what, what do you feel like when you're being busted in, in a store? <sighs> Humiliated, yeah. I mean, you look like a degenerate. Yeah, you're a drug addict, thief. Yeah, and I mean that's what people think, and they don't, you know, they don't know any better. They don't know me. They don't know my story. They don't know my family or where I came from. You know, and uh, they don't know that. You know, they have no way of knowing whether I feel any shame or, you know, what what reasons I have for for doing that or what I even spend the money on. You know, uh, do you have children? No, thankfully, no. <laughs> um, how old are you? 36. 36. 36. Yeah, how long do you think you'll be doing this? I don't know. <laughs> I'm tired, you know, but, uh, it's hard, it's hard to, um, when Obama was campaigning the first time, uh, he made this speech and he said, you know, people say, uh, you know, that folks should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, but what do you do when you don't have any boots, right? It's kind of like that. Do you sometimes feel like your life just got out of, out of your own control? Yeah. I lost my mom a couple years ago. Uh, so since then, everything's just been, I don't even know. And I lost her to an overdose, which is crazy, because she's the last person that I thought, um, I mean, that's like the last way that anybody knew her would guess that she would, she would die. Uh, yeah, and I mean, I knew she had a couple DUIs and drinking problems, just, you know, doing cocaine here and there, but... I just wasn't in contact with her as much as I should have been. Just had no idea what was going on. And she overdosed from Xanax and cocaine, I guess. And I was in jail when it happened. So that was the last time I talked to my mom. It's like the the free minute phone call you get.
and it's just kind of all that I had, you know, I don't, I mean, the closest blood relative I have is, you know, in, in the Middle East, <laughs> My stepdad, they, they divorced right after I finished high school and he got remarried and he's got two little girls and um, he tries really hard to like be in my life and be supportive and um, last time I was in jail, uh, I made plans to get into recovery and go down to Los Angeles where um, my best friend from like uh, middle school and high school lives. Um, she uh, been asking me to move to LA over and over and over again ever since she went down there to start her master's at UCLA. And um, I guess I finally took her up on the offer, but I ended up bailing. Uh, I don't even know why. But, um, that last time, uh, I stepped, I kind of finally acknowledged, um, you know, the role that he played and kind of like the abuse and the things that he did to me, which prior to that, he kind of, he didn't just like, uh, fail to acknowledge them. He, I mean, he denied that it ever happened for a while. Um, kind of like, you know, it was like gaslighting me for a bit, uh, what do you think the cause is of your your addiction and your situation? Uh, is this something, just some addiction that you um, inherited from your family, or do you think it's? I think that you know. I think that plays. I think that plays a role. I think mental health and, and emotional health is like a bigger, bigger culprit. Um, I don't know how how much faith I have in like you know psychiatric like diagnoses and, and analyses, but uh, I've been in and out of therapy a lot. Uh, my stepdad worked for Eli Lilly, which is like one of the you know, big pharmaceutical companies, for a long time, um, and had really good health insurance for a while. So I was in and out of um, therapy for a while. Yeah, and so they thought I was depressed, and so I was on and off a bunch of medications. And um, finally, uh, when I was clean for that year in, in Albuquerque, I saw a therapist, um, kind of of my own volition, and uh, she had diagnosed me um, with borderline personality disorder. Uh, and the more I, you know, I guess, looked into that, and the more I learned about it, um, you know. Uh, so did it make sense to you? Yeah. Um, I remember uh, telling um, my best friend, um, Erica, who lives in L.A., I remember uh, telling her that I was, I was relieved, almost, you know, um, because it finally made sense, you know. Uh, like, there's, you know, a, a name that I could ascribe to, you know, just like this, these, like, feelings, this dysfunction that, that I keep, you know, encountering, like, within, you know, within myself, and, you know, gave an explanation as to why, like, I, you know, just can't fucking function like a normal person, you know, I mean, it's, it's not that hard, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's what everybody has to do, you fucking work, you pay your rent, you know, you uh, you support yourself, you do what you have to do. Uh, the majority of people are, you know, capable of uh, <laughs> operating at least on that basic level, but... The borderline personality disorder can have some serious symptoms, you know, the problems that are associated with it are, are serious. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's no, there's no medication for it. Um, and even the treatment for it is you know, undeveloped and, and um, there's a lot more research being done on it. I know that. Uh, but, um, 
they say it's, it's a, it's requ it requires a different form of therapy. Like, um, like when you go to a therapist, you're probably going to, uh, talk to them, work your problems out with them. And, and, and they call it like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, for borderline personality disorder, uh, they say that you have to, uh, you have to have a dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, and then group therapy is also like a big aspect of that, which sounds irritating to me <laughs> just already. Uh, um, just like by virtue of the fact that borderline personality Borderline personalities are the way that they are. Like those traits or characteristics, I don't like preclude them from being able to like, like commit to, you know, like a commit to therapy in that way, in that sense. You know what I mean? It's like I think probably rare that that anybody, you know. Like eventually you're gonna miss miss an appointment and you stop going and you. That's you know, the nature of being borderline. Exactly. So you can you can know what the problem is and maybe even see what the solution might be, but you can't bring yourself to do it. Yeah. Because you're borderline. I don't know why. I don't know. It's fucking maddening. Um, you know it. I know I'm capable of, you know, like, uh, capable of these things, but I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why I do the things that I do a lot of the time, you know? What's the darkest or, or more serious that it's gotten? Um... I think it was a, two years ago, two and a half years ago, it was a little while after my mom died. It was a period of like, I think it was like three weeks that I didn't go outside. I was inside of the hotel room for like three weeks straight. And I was with somebody, I had somebody that was living with me and he was supporting, supporting me or us. Uh, so he would go out and take care of what was necessary, and I would, I would just slept all day. And when he would come home with the drugs, I would wake up, and, uh, you know, he would shoot me up with the dope. And, I don't know, just you know, watch TV or just whatever the fuck. Probably fall back asleep, maybe eat something, and, uh, yeah, go back to sleep and wake up the next day. Whenever he comes back, you know, through the door with some more drugs and do it all over again. And I mean, that was, that was literally like my life. I didn't get out of bed. I didn't want to do anything. I didn't, I, I just, and obviously I knew what I was doing wasn't healthy, but I just didn't really care. It was like. And there's a, there's a strong aspect of like self indulgence I think that I think I feel like that's more than like any hereditary or or you know uh, like mental health factors I think I think that's like that's more detriment, detrimental to 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 me personally at least than anything else. Um, there's, you know, it's obviously, you know, you hear, I'm sure you hear it all the time, it's instant gratification. Um, and it's just, you know, you, you don't have to think about anything, you know? I mean, things are just like, my life is so fucked up. I don't even know where to start, you know? And so it's just easier to just, you know, I, I don't, I can't even open the box. Like, I'm just, 
But then, like you said, how long am I going to do that for? You know? It's like living on the street and not having any responsibilities is preferable to living a, a normal life. Given all the responsibilities and all the hassles that go with it. I mean, when I when I was sober in, in Albuquerque and, and you know I was working, um, I mean, it was like a marked improvement in like my sense of self worth that like I noticed, you know, and I do feel good when I'm working, you know, and when I'm functioning like that, you know, it's when I'm, I'm needed or somebody's relying on me and I'm able to fulfill my obligations. So it's not so much. Like, I don't f find the demands of that taxing. It's just getting from here to there is, like, I don't even know where to start. You know, most people are like, well, go to rehab. And it's... Uh... That period you were you were clean? Mm-hmm. So your health, mental health might have been better, but your mental health being better might have helped you stay clean. Right. I didn't go to rehab. I didn't, you know, uh, I started seeing the, the therapist that diagnosed me, um, but that was, you know, like seven, eight months in. Um, you know, I, I kicked uh, kicked the opiates uh, by myself at home uh, and just kind of forced myself to push through it, you know, and I slept through it, took some, some Xanax and just slept through all the, the shitty parts of it. Uh, woke up like a week later, super dazed, but <laughs> I wasn't dope sick. Uh, and, um, that was it. I mean, I just, I just kind of hit the ground running and, and it was like, she's like, my friend said it was so easy to get a job and, and I pretty much, you know, got one like within, you know, like two weeks of being there right away. It's a really nice salon. I was working as a receptionist. And uh, I started bartending. It's making a lot of money. And, you know, like once once you get the ball rolling, I mean, it's, you know, I'm like, I'm great. I'm totally capable of, you know, functioning and, and you know, but uh, it only takes like that one time, you know. Uh, It's fucked up because, like, the dope's not even really that good, man. <laughs> I don't know if it's better in other cities, but the drugs in San Francisco are just, like, trash. And everybody's fucking dying. Nobody knows what the hell's in the stuff. It's, uh... You know, like, moments like this, I'm like, why the hell am I doing this to myself, right? But... Just like too loaded of a question to try and answer. You know? Is there anything you're learning from going through all this? I've learned a lot about people, other people. Uh, really ugly side of people. But there is also something to be said for like that just kind of like stripped down like vulnerability that you know everybody is sort of you know, exhibiting or experiencing, like, whether they realize it or not. You know, when you don't care about anything but, you know, getting, getting your drugs, like, you know, you don't care what you look like, how you're dressed, you know, some people, you know, don't bother getting hotel rooms ever. You know, I was like, I know people that haven't showered in like weeks. 
you know. Now, I've gone weeks without showering myself, uh, you know. And I just, like, I could never have imagined that before. Like, I would never have pictured this for myself, you know. And I remember even when I first got out here, I, like, telling my friends, you know, like, if I get to, you know, such and such a, a point, you know, where I'm looking like this or I'm doing this, you know, like, it's, it's like, I need you to give me a wake-up call, you know? And, uh, I have, like, gone through all of those, uh, <laughs> all of those, uh, I guess, like, fears or things that I, you know, I just didn't want to happen or, or didn't think I would let happen or just thought it would be, like, too much. Like, okay, at that point, I know it's too much. I'm just going to have to, like, pull back. Uh, but it didn't, I don't know, it doesn't happen. And you just keep getting older and time keeps going by and... and you feel tired, your body's decrepit, health is horrible. And I think about getting away, but I don't really, you know, there's nowhere to go. I miss my mom a lot. Uh, Sometimes I think about just, like, picking up and just going back to Ashgabat and spending time with my grandma before she passes away or, you know, spending time with my family, but that doesn't seem very realistic. <sighs> my family I do have here, like my stepdaddy, you know, practices like the love with attachment sort of thing so like I can't go you know I'm not welcome I'm not welcome there you think it's more likely that you all figure a way out or is it more likely that you'll lose your life out here I mean of course I want to say you know, I'll get better and finish school and uh, you know go on to do all the things I want to do, but I don't know, I feel like I, the odds are like, the statistics are, are not in my favor. I'm sure you've lost a lot of friends. Too many to count. Especially this last year. People are just dropping dead like flies. It's, you become numb to it. It's sickening. Yeah. I think that might be the one thing that would pull me through it is just like that fundamental just like fear of death or the fear of ceasing to exist and what that means or You know, I'm not, like, I'm not a religious person, or, you know, I don't believe in afterlife or anything like that, so it's, it's, it's like a mind fuck to think about it, you know, you can't ascribe a, a feeling to the experience of not existing anymore, you know. It's something that's terrified me my whole life. I hate thinking about it. But I feel like if anything, that might be the the one thing that I 
that pulls me out of this. I don't want to die. I don't want to die ever. But I definitely don't want to die out here like this. You know? uh, it seems like such a cold and heartless and pathetic way to go. You know? And then, you know, all the sacrifices that, you know, people made to give me the opportunities that I've had uh, are for nothing, you know? You know, people say, oh, your mom's looking down at you, and, you know, she sees you. Well, I don't, <laughs> that's bullshit. Uh, but... There is this, like, strong, like, like sense. I mean, that's, like, the one drive or, like, desire I do have, I think, is just to, like, fulfill what she wanted for me, which was, you know, she was very academically driven, so... Uh, you know, just to, to finish my master's and, and go on to, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, live my, uh, live my dreams, you know, uh, get to do all the things that you know there are the reasons behind you know me going to school in the first place because there's a lot of debt so much student loan debt you know it was so important to her that I finished I finished my degree it was so important to her I mean, towards the end, I remember, I think she finally just gave in. She was like, I just want you to be happy. I don't, I don't really care, you know, what you're doing. She just accepted that this is the life that I was living and that she had to, you know, be okay with that in order to, like, be a part of it to the greatest, you know, degree that she could. Uh, you know, instead of putting that pressure on me, she realized that that kind of alienated me because I, I felt guilty, you know, that I, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be, what she wanted me to be doing, what I, you know, wanted to do, thought I should be doing. Uh, Is there guilt you feel because of that? Oh, yeah. Tremendous amount. I think that, uh, I know that if I hadn't, if my life wasn't like this, I, you know, I don't think that my mom would have. I don't think that her life would have gone in the direction that it did. And so I feel largely responsible for that. She kind of put all of her, uh, you know, she would tell me all the time, you know, you're all I have, you know, and she kind of put all of her hopes and dreams into me and, and She expected a lot out of me. I don't think she expected too much. I think she expected anything that I'm not capable of, of doing. Uh, she expected me to, you know, be my best and do my best, and this is my absolute worst. I think it was hard for her to see that. But she felt like she'd lost me. And there were times when I didn't talk to her for... I think it was maybe like two years I didn't call her. And I I I didn't call because I, I was doing the same thing, you know, and so I didn't have anything new to tell her. I'm still here, I'm still on the street, still shooting dope. And I don't want to tell her that and I don't want to lie to her. Uh so what's the point? And you know and when I finally did talk to her, she's like, well, I just wanted to know if you were fucking alive. <laughs> you know? She's like, I already know what you're doing, so <laughs> I, was just, I, I didn't know if you were alive or dead and it hit me hard when she said that uh, 
I think that the way that my life has turned out so far was the cause of a lot of pain and grief. And I think she felt guilty and she felt responsible. And uh, you know, everybody's oh no, you can't think that way. It's not your fault. But that's just a nice thing to say. These drugs are just heartbreaking, no matter how you look at it. Your story, your mom's story. Yeah. I know that there's more than this, you know, I have to, I have to cling on to that. I know there's, there's more to life than this. And I know that it can be better. You know, I've lived it, even if it was for a short, short period of time, you know, relatively speaking. I hope you find it. Me too. Renina, thank you very much.